Hi there, Johnny the Queer Potus here, and today we're going to be taking a trip across 2,000 miles of Mexican territory. Now, the land we're going to be walking across today may be familiar to you all as the American West, but we're going to be trekking across these landscapes before they officially belong to the United States of America. And we're going to take that journey by accompanying the Mormon Battalion. The Mormon Battalion marched 2,000 miles across Mexican territory to the state of California. And by the time they arrived, it belonged to the United States. How did all this happen? Well, there's only one way to find out. In the summer of 1846, a dragoon of U.S. cavalrymen rode across the southern plains of Iowa Territory. The land had become a refuge in recent years for a diverse group of peoples. There were refugees from the Sac and the Fox tribes of the Great Lakes. They'd been systematically stripped of their land by Indian removal policies and pushed ever further west by American expansion. There were also members of the Potawatomi. Many of them had fought in the Black Hawk War, a 15-week-long pan-Indian uprising that nearly brought white settlement to its knees. Far from their ancestral homes, the Sac and Fox and the Potawatomi bided their time. Unable to hunt and fish in their traditional ways, they were reduced to sustaining themselves through trade with the very white settlers who'd driven them there. Among the whites they traded with was an unusual group of religious misfits. They too were refugees, chased from town to town across the whole American Midwest by angry mobs and cruel state militias. While many whites reviled them as evildoers, these folks called themselves saints. Most of us today know them as Mormons. Up until 1844, the Saints lived on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River, in a town they'd built called Nauvoo. For the last few years, the Saints traded with the Sac and Fox and Potawatomi to the west. The exchange of commodities gave way to the exchange of ideas and culture. Joseph Smith, founder of the Saints and chief prophet, had audiences with Sac and Fox chief Keokuk, with whom he shared the revelations of the Book of Mormon. Smith's book told stories of the Lamanites, who he claimed were the ancestors of the Native Americans, how they were once a great civilization that ruled the continent. Keokuk was pleasantly surprised at the important role Native Americans played in the saints' religious text, an unusual departure from most Orthodox Christian faiths. The time is close at hand when the Sac and Fox, along with all others, will once again become a righteous people and help the saints build a temple in Zion for the second coming of Christ. For a group of people like the Sac and Fox who are trying to preserve an ancestral way of life, Smith's plan for them was far-fetched to say the least. To many, Old Joe, as he was known, and his strange followers remained little more than a curiosity. Nevertheless, the developing alliances between Smith and Keokuk did not fail to escape the notice of American authorities patrolling the frontier. A grand conspiracy is being entered into between the Mormons and the Indians to destroy all the white settlements on the frontier. Tensions were heightened as Illinois newspapers began printing salacious stories about the saints. Among such outrageous deeds as preaching polytheism and practicing polygamy came accusations of sinister and seditious plots. The fact that Joseph Smith was seeking the Democratic Party nomination for president in 1844 only fueled suspicion about a Mormon conspiracy. Finally, a rumor of a plot to assassinate the governor of Illinois gained circulation in local papers, and anti-Mormon sentiment reached fever pitch. In the summer of 1844, Joseph Smith was arrested. While he sat in his cell writing clemency appeals to state and federal officials, a mob of 200 men marched on the jail where Smith was being held, demanding he be handed over. 
the jailers had no choice but to give in to the outsized mob, and Smith was murdered. From this point, threats of extermination against the saints only grew louder. Smith's successor, Brigham Young, finally faced the tragic inevitability. Nauvoo would have to be abandoned. On February 4, 1844, the saints crossed over the frozen Mississippi River to join the Sac and Fox and Potawatomi in Iowa. Taking only what they could carry with them, they headed west toward an uncertain future. Across 400 miles of scattered settlements, 20,000 saints posted up for the harsh winters and scorching summers on the plains. This is where that dragoon of U.S. soldiers found them in 1846. But more on that later. The exodus of the saints and the removal of the Sac and Fox and Potawatomi are just a few chapters in an anthology of tragic tales about the victims of American expansion. When 13 colonies on the east coast of North America declared themselves the first independent democratic republic in the Western Hemisphere, the hopes of all freedom-loving people across the world were ignited. But for all the high-minded rhetoric of its founders, the United States could never truly escape empire mentality. Whether it was the prospect of land and resources, or fear of European empires getting there first, the United States quickly became indistinguishable from the old system it was purporting to fight against. By the time our story takes place, the U.S. was a fully functioning empire machine, well oiled by the steady flow of European credit and powered in large part by stolen African-American labor. America's expansion westward hit a snag in 1837, however, with the Panic of 1837, aptly named, a devastating economic depression. Through three presidential administrations, the U.S. trudged along until the election of 1844, when a fairly unknown politician with a bold platform made an unexpected rise to the nation's highest office. James K. Polk, who'd lost his last two elections for governor of Tennessee, entered a primary field dominated by establishment icons. Without much to lose, Polk campaigned on the most unabashed and ambitious expansionist platform of anyone in the entire race. In a stunning upset, the dark horse surged ahead in the Democratic convention, taking his party's nomination and delivering a close but decisive victory against Whig dinosaur Henry Clay. The day before Polk took office, outgoing President John Tyler signed a treaty officially annexing Texas to the Union. The problem was that Texas was located on land that was still claimed by Mexico. Now, many in the United States were up to the challenge of fighting Mexico for this land, but Polk wondered if America's territorial ambitions might stretch even further. Texas was only a small sliver of a gigantic piece of continental land which the European empires recognized as part of Mexico. The Mexicans had inherited it when they overthrew the Spanish in 1810, but most of the land still belonged to the tribal confederations of Apache, Comanche, and hundreds of others who fiercely guarded the land against the Mexicans, the Americans, the British, the French, you name it. The Mexicans' inability or unwillingness to subjugate indigenous people disqualified them as stewards of the land in the minds of many Americans. At the time, there was a growing belief among Americans in a manifest destiny for their country. That is, the idea that the United States, with its superior cultural, political, and economic institutions, was destined to rule the North American continent. President Polk was not an especially religious man, but he did believe in manifest destiny, and his entire life was an expression of it. As a boy, he and his family had been part of the wave of white immigration which flooded into the Tennessee Valley after Thomas Jefferson's removal policies cleared the land of what it classified as hostile Indians. Expansion didn't stop at Tennessee though, and James's early career involved management and expansion of his family's slave empire. Polk was able to purchase plantations as far as the Mississippi Valley, 
at the time, the western frontier of the American Empire. Polk also had many local heroes to look up to in Tennessee. Conquerors like Andrew Jackson, who launched a vigilante invasion of Florida and helped annex the state to the Union. Andrew Jackson was an early supporter and mentor to young James K. Polk, and was his chief advocate in the 1844 election. Jackson even played matchmaker for young James, urging him to marry the daughter of a wealthy slaveholding family named Sarah Childress. Sarah became Polk's closest ally and most effective political advisor throughout his career. Now Polk was in the White House, and looking at boundless frontiers that were ripe for the taking. Looking to settle the Texas question, Polk carried on several negotiations with the government of Mexico, but none came to fruition. And so he sent a force under the command of General Zachary Taylor from Louisiana to Corpus Christi on the banks of the Nueces River. This was the internationally recognized border between Texas and Mexico. But in the spring of 1846, when negotiations failed, Polk ordered Taylor to march beyond the recognized borders of Texas to the Rio Grande. President Polk claimed that this too counted as Texas, and should the Mexicans attack them there, they would be committing an act of war against the United States. While Taylor's troops waited like sitting ducks to be attacked, Polk sent a letter to Admiral John D. Sloat, commanding a fleet of American naval vessels off the coast of California. If you ascertain with certainty that Mexico has declared war against the United States, you will at once possess yourself of the port of San Francisco and blockade and occupy such other ports as your forces permit. Now the trap was set, and Polk waited for the Mexican army to take the bait. Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant described what came next. The presence of United States troops on the edge of disputed territory farthest from the Mexican settlements was not sufficient to provoke hostilities. We were sent to provoke a fight, but it was essential that Mexico should commence it. It was very doubtful whether Congress would declare war, but if Mexico should attack our troops, the executive could announce, whereas war exists by the acts of, etc., and prosecute the contest with vigor. The attack Lieutenant Grant feared so much finally came on April 25th, when a 2,000-man Mexican regiment attacked 70 U.S. soldiers near Matamoros, killing about a dozen. True to Grant's prediction, Polk and the media played the skirmish off as a kind of 9-11. Days later, Polk sent his fiery war message to Congress. Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon the American soil. She has proclaimed that hostilities have commenced and that the two nations are now at war. As war exists, and notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it, exists by the act of Mexico herself, we are called upon by every consideration of duty and patriotism to vindicate with decision the honor, the rights, and the interests of our country. Considering the fact that U.S. troops were already engaged with the Mexican army, the Congress was merely rubber stamping what Polk had already unleashed. At the time, the U.S. had only a small, dedicated force of federal regulars at its disposal. So, rather than build an army, Polk played the excitement of the moment and his country's nationalist fervor to make a broad call for volunteer service. Essentially, in a rather disorganized manner, Polk was about to open up the border between the United States and Mexico to any two-bit adventurer, pillager, and treasure seeker with a gun. As Polk wrote out countless orders, raising units across the country, a representative of the Mormon Church in Washington, D.C., named Jesse C. Little, made an appointment with the president. Little sat down with the president and told him about all those young, able-bodied saints twiddling their thumbs on the Iowa Plains. Desperate for recruits, Polk wrote out an order to form the first and only religious-based military unit in U.S. history the Mormon Battalion. Polk ordered 500 to 1,000 Mormon soldiers to be recruited in Iowa for a 2,000-mile journey across Mexican territory. They would first head to Santa Fe to join up with General Kearney's Army of the West, then on to California, where they would complete their service. The Saints would receive $3.50 a day, and after 12 months, 
they were free to do as they please. Back in Iowa, the saints knew little of these machinations going on in the capital, and when this dragoon of U.S. soldiers showed up on that summer day, most of the saints greeted them with suspicion and contempt. I was glad to hear of war against the United States and was in hopes it might never end until they were entirely destroyed, for they had driven us into the wilderness. But attitudes quickly changed when Brigham Young and other church leaders brought the others up to speed on what was going on. What appeared to be a grave misfortune was actually a blessing for the saints. Since the founding of the Church of Christ, the saints had wandered ceaselessly in search of a homeland, what Joseph Smith called New Jerusalem. They thought they'd found it in Kirtland, Ohio, but anti-Mormon purges sent them running west. In Jackson County, Missouri, conflict with local Missourians resulted in open warfare and the eventual escape to Nauvoo. As life grew more dangerous for the saints there, Joseph Smith started preaching that the New Jerusalem might lie somewhere beyond the Rocky Mountains. The thought of moving that far west unnerved most saints in the 1840s. Harsh, unpredictable environments, governed by tribal dynamics they scarcely understood, seemed like less than a welcoming prospect. But with a United States military escort, they could cross into the West much more safely. Volunteers were taken from every settlement along the plains as the group continued to move West. In many of the settlements, the U.S. soldiers ran up against the vehement protests of women who refused to allow their husbands to be taken away from them. Thanks to their persistence, 31 women with 44 children were able to join the march officially as laundresses. The presence of women and children made the Mormon battalion extremely unique among all the other units in the United States Army. By the time the party arrived in the westernmost town of Council Bluffs, there were already hundreds of saints ready for recruitment. The Saturday before setting off, the saints danced and played fiddles. They sang songs about reaching the promised land, which now more than ever seemed close at hand. The next morning, Sunday, Brigham Young gave one final sermon to the outgoing soldiers before they set out on their incredible journey. You are now going into an enemy's land at your country's call. If you live by your religion, obey and respect your officers, and hold sacred the property of the people among whom you travel, I promise you, in the name of Israel's God, that not one of you shall fall by the hand of the enemy. On July 20th, 1846, the Mormon battalion, 496 strong, and with the Prophet's blessing, set out for California. Almost from the very start, the romance of the march lost its flair. In the first few days, the Mormon battalion was plagued by heavy rainstorms, which kept their clothing perpetually soaked. Eating was no picnic either. Saints carried bags of flour with them, and when the right kind of bowl-shaped basin in the rocks could be found, they would mix the flour with water to create a bland dough. Placing the dough around a stick, they slow-cooked it over a fire to create bread. Still, the saints could not live by bread alone. Passing local farms, the famished troops stole potatoes, plums, onions, and other vegetables much to the chagrin of local farmers. The cold and rainy days were punctuated by extreme heat, which one soldier described as hot enough to melt cheese. Unsurprisingly, sickness became the marcher's constant companion. Cholera, diarrhea, plagued the saints every step of the way. Only three days into the march, and the battalion experienced its first death. Private Samuel Boley, died of an unnamed illness. Unfortunately, the medical care they received proved to be an even bigger issue for the Mormon battalion. Dr. Sanderson, a government-appointed physician who held contempt for Mormons and cussed constantly in their presence, became an object of particular disgust within the unit. Besides his behavior and attitude, Dr. Sapperston, as he became known, often prescribed a mercury supplement to his patients called calomel. Many pioneers took mercury pills like calomel on their journeys west 
to mitigate digestive diseases. In fact, scholars have even been able to trace the journeys of pioneers like Lewis and Clark by following mercury deposits left in their latrine pits. The problem was, the saints had a prohibition on mineral-based medicines, and so they refused to take the pills. This frustrated Dr. Sanderson to no end, and the angry physician resorted to force-feeding his patients the medicine, as one private remembered. Dr. Sanderson had me taken morning and evening to his tent and administered the medicine with his own hand, but not a bit of it got into my stomach as I would hold it into my mouth until I was taken out of the tent and then spit it out. A popular prayer around camp soon became, Lord, deliver us from Dr. Sanderson. And the saints even devised a parody to the popular 1840s hit song, Jim Along Joe, in dubious honor of the hated doctor. A doctor which the government has furnished proves a punishment at his root call of Jim Along Joe. The sick and halt to him must go, both night and morn his call is heard. Our indignation then is stirred, and we sincerely wish in hell his arsenic and calomel. Despite discomfort, hunger, and malevolent doctors, the battalion continued to move steadily across the Kansas plains at an average of 20 miles a day. The Mormon battalion took a northerly route, the Santa Fe Trail, hoping to remain north of a loosely defined area called Comancheria, an area tightly controlled by the Comanches. Onward, the saints marched through the dry, arid lands until they were overjoyed by the sighting of a large, freshwater lake in the distance. As the saints marched closer toward the crystal clear and appetizing waters, the lake moved away. Closer still they marched, as the lake yet again shifted into the distance. It was a mirage, and the only water the saints found that day was in a stagnant pond filled with bugs, rain, and buffalo urine. Beggars could not be choosers, and the famished saints filled their canteens. They'd learned to drink with their teeth clenched to keep from swallowing all the bugs in their water. After many weeks and much sickness, on October 10th, the battalion arrived at Santa Fe, where President Polk had sent a huge military force ahead of them to occupy lands he hoped would soon be part of the United States. When Colonel Philip St. George Cook found out that he was going to be taking command of the Mormon battalion from this point on its march to California, it was not a happy moment for the rising officer. The battalion was enlisted too much by families. Some were old, some feeble, and some too young. It was embarrassed by many women. It was undisciplined. Their clothes were very scant. Their mules were utterly broken down. They have never been drilled. They exhibit great heedlessness and ignorance and some obstinacy. At Santa Fe, the Saints finally received news of the chaos taking place miles south of their position. General Zachary Taylor's troops had won an impressive victory at Buena Vista, but the Mexicans had also bested the Americans at several engagements. In a move so familiar to us today, the Americans assured themselves conflict with a substandard power like Mexico would bring a swift and glorious victory to the United States. But six months, and with no end in sight, Polk's War of Conquest was becoming a protracted military occupation. The prolonged presence of Americans stirred up Mexican nationalism as well. Figures like Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, a beloved Mexican hero, rose up to fill the power vacuum left by an American invasion. Back on the American home front, War fever grew in the press, and popular novels serialized the exploits of American troops. The Mexican Ranchero, a particular bestseller, told the story of a romance between an American soldier and a Mexican woman. Playing into the power fantasies of male soldiers, the book equated the conquest of Mexico with the conquest of a woman, and the idea caught on. In a mass meeting in support of the war, Former Texas President Sam Houston called on recruits with an enticing proposal. Take a trip of exploration and look out for the beautiful senoritas. And if you should choose to annex them, no doubt the result of this annexation will be a most powerful one. The dream of possessing Mexican women pushed countless thousands to sign up as volunteers for an adventure in Mexico. But these darknesses were often papered over by a cheering press and a growing sense in America's manifest destiny. 
Around the time of General Taylor's success at Buena Vista, Captain R.A. Stewart, a volunteer and ordained minister, sermonized on the white man's mission in Mexico. We are here to shed light and make the inhabitants over the dark borders embrace the blessings of freedom. The Anglo-Saxon race was not only to take possession of the whole North American continent, but to influence and modify the character of the world. For those caught in the middle of the conflict, the blessings of freedom meant rape, pillage, and murder. Far off in the trenches of battle, soldiers like Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant described atrocities committed by American troops. A great many murders. Some of the volunteers and about all the Texans seem to think it perfectly right to impose upon the people of a conquered city to any extent. An event murder them where the act can be covered by dark. And how much they seem to enjoy acts of violence too. I would not pretend to guess the number of murders that have been committed upon persons of poor Mexicans. The American soldiers themselves had a rough time of it, losing 10% of their forces to disease while 20% were maimed or killed in engagements with the enemy. As more news of the dreadful events began leaking out of Mexico, anti-war sentiment grew back east. Soon, congressional investigations were opening up to look into whether President Polk had lied the American people into a disastrous and protracted war. A little-known Whig congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln took the floor of the House in 1847. He called for his colleagues to adopt a resolution investigating whether the exact spot where hostilities first broke out really did fall under U.S. jurisdiction as President Polk continued to insist. Anxious to make a name for himself, the upstart Lincoln delivered a scathing rebuke of Mr. Polk's war. What I more than suspect already is that he is deeply conscious of being in the wrong, that he feels the blood of this war, like the blood of Abel, is crying to heaven against him. Lincoln's protests fell mostly on deaf ears, especially far out west, where the saints continued to march toward the Pacific. Only a few days outside of Santa Fe, the saints were preoccupied with thoughts of hunger and thirst. They were overjoyed to reach the Pima villages scattered along the Gila River in December. There they were able to trade some items, including the buttons on their clothes, for food. The Pima themselves were excited to encounter the saints, for many of them the first white people they'd ever seen. In contrast to the hunter clans of the Apache and Comanche, the Pima were an agricultural people, and most whites considered them to be friendly Indians. The Pimas are a friendly people. They were never at war with the United States, and as a matter of fact, often helped the army fight off the Apaches and other warlike Indians. In the dry climates of what would one day be the state of Arizona, the Pima irrigated the river and produced crops of wheat, corn, beans, pumpkins, melons, and cotton. Thankful for the aid and comfort they'd received at the Pima villages, the saints gave the Pima three U's, the first they'd ever seen in their lives. By crossing through these lands yet untouched by white civilization, the saints created the first trail along which thousands of pioneers would move during the great westward migrations later in the century. The Pima largely maintained friendly relations with the whites until high-tech American farmers began irrigating the Gila River in the 1920s drying up much of the Pima's water supply. The experience of the Pima is a sad reminder that even those who tried to live in harmony with the pioneers often received the short end of the stick in the end. The saints pressed on across the mountainous terrain on their way towards their final destination. When the saints finally crossed into California a week later, they entered a land that had undergone a dramatic transformation. Back in June of 1846, around the time hostilities broke out on the Rio Grande, the American Pacific Fleet, acting on orders from the president, moved in to capture key settlements along the California coast. Meanwhile, in the north, a group of guerrilla soldiers under the command of General John C. Fremont came down from the mountains into the town of Sonoma on June 14th and captured it without firing a shot. There they raised the bear flag over the town square, which to this day remains the flag of California. What looked like an easy victory 
was only the beginning of a long and bloody struggle. Mexican leaders and generals regrouped and effected a fierce resistance against the American conquest. The battle for California raged on until January 8, 1847, when the last resistance fighters, known as Californios, were surrounded by U.S. troops and forced to surrender. Less than three weeks later, the Mormon battalion serendipitously arrived in a now American California. They spent the remainder of their 12-month service manning garrisons and forts, and were finally decommissioned in the summer of 1847. By this point, the weary travelers were relieved. They had made a 2,000-mile journey, suffered minimal casualties, and just as Brigham Young had told them, not a single member of the battalion fell by the hand of the enemy, primarily due to the fact that the Mormon battalion had no contact with the enemy. Still, prophecy fulfilled. At the end of an unprecedented journey, the Saints had escaped the United States, only to find themselves once again in the United States. In the winter of 1848, after two sorrowful years, the exhausted Mexican and American governments signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, officially ending the war. Although the treaty did not give the United States dominion over all of Mexico, it did cede about 525,000 square miles of land to the United States, from Texas to California. And so the map of the United States as we see it today, almost, is the map that James K. Polk helped to create. And this is the process that created the geography of our country. The process that created the southern border between Texas and Mexico. All of these stories and events took place on a continent very much different than the one you and I live on today. And as for the president himself, James Polk, who took the United States from sea to shining sea, completed the transition of America as a republic into America as an empire. Polk was not the first president to do this, and he would not be the last. Despite the tremendous success of James K. Polk's single term in office, Polk decided not to seek a second term. President Polk was exhausted. He had already shown signs of sickness toward the end of his term. Three months after leaving office, Polk died, the shortest post-presidency in history. Polk is often mistakenly considered one of the forgotten presidents. But in reality, he's actually one of the most influential and important. Polk came into office when a steadily expanding country had reached an impasse. By provoking this war with Mexico, James K. Polk broke the dam and allowed the blessings of representative democracy to spread across the whole continent.